the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. In today's episode, we're throwing it back to a presentation from Max Lacan 2018. Chelsea Lambert shares her presentation, The State of Legal Entrepreneurship. Let's get to it. So first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, It's not often that I get to speak to a group of kind of believers in the space. So I know that all of you are either followers of the podcast or have met Jim or Tyson in some way, shape or form through other mediums. For those of you who listened to the podcast episode that I was on, you can tell I'm just a little bit passionate about some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So it's a great honor and privilege for me to be delivering this particular session to you because I've wanted to teach this for a long time. And I had the privilege of meeting some of the finest entrepreneurs in the world a few years ago at an event called Summit at Sea. And basically you take a cruise with the founders of Zappos and Uber and rocket scientists and people from NASA. And I mean, just the collection of some of the greatest minds um, in our, of our time. And during that cruise, I and you're basically on a boat with these people for three to five days. So you're just immersed and you're hanging out with them and all these conversations are happening. Came up with the concept of building the 100-year law firm and the legacy that we leave behind. And it came from a talk that Tony Shea, the founder of Zappos, had given during that event. And he said, I'm not interested in building a company for myself. I'm not interested in building a company that's just going to serve my personal goals. I'm interested in building a 100 or 1,000 year business, something that lives and provides for our community long after we are gone. And it really got me thinking about, you know, what's different today than it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago when law firms were very much generational and they were cornerstones in their community and they provided for the neighborhoods around them. And so if we look at just kind of the, the makeup of those law firms, and the state of our industry today, you know, comparing them to the Sidleys or um, the Bernstein insurers or, you know, where we are now compared to some of those firms that were started hundreds of years ago, where did we get lost? Because today, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but this is where we are. So Jim had, you know, lightly touched on some of the challenges, and I see this, I teach all over the country and I coach in incubators and I talk to attorneys who have just started their practice that are working a part-time job at Whole Foods or struggling solos. The median income of a solo attorney in the U.S. is $49,100. So when we look at the challenges that we have today, the debt, the depression, the anxiety, we feel like selling legal services is something that we should feel guilty for our hesitation to get uh, delegate and then mistrust of our peers. We don't want to hire because we're afraid that they're going to take the business away from us and go start their own firm. It's created this um, pattern of um, a cycle of, of non-growth, right? And so you do have people that will go out and will start law firms and be successful, but it's not the, the same pattern of growth and scalability that we used to see knowing that the law firm would be passed on for generations to come. And so what I want to talk about today is the foundations of building a successful law firm that if you wanted to, 
could last the next 100 years, that can provide for the community around you. And those are a lot of the topics that we're going to see from our speakers today on marketing, on technology, on business management. So what are the factors that these law firms have and their leadership? They had a niche and a focus. They followed mission statements or core values. Over the last 20, 30 years, especially, you see the larger firms in their markets. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the biggest filer. It means that you have to have systems and that you have to let, learn to let go a little bit and delegate and empower your employees. So they force processes even when it's difficult. And then they optimized and repeated that over and over again. So the two most common law firm paths are the ones with no systems and the ones that have built that, whether it even be in paper, have measurable KPIs, they grow in scale, they're profitable, they incentivize their employees, they show that there's a path for them, a growth incentive. And then the ones that don't, no documented processes, are vulnerable to that market turbulence, to those crashes and ebbs and flows of the economy. And they often rotate through employees quite frequently. I teach on everything from hiring to technology to business management and consistently see the same patterns no matter where I am in the country. And so it's not about me, it's about we, and that is something that is really, really hard to adopt in the law firm environment because you're worried about associates coming in and taking your book of business and going and starting their own firm. I hear it all the time. Why don't solos grow? Well, every associate that I've had or it's too much time to train or I don't want to spend the time documenting the processes. I'm an entrepreneur as well. right? So I've gone through the same frustrations. I'm actually an entrepreneur a few times over, some successful and some not. I'm happy to say that today it's, it's uh, the successful side. But when I wasn't succeeding, it was because either I was withholding or I didn't want to take the time to invest in management or I didn't want to take the time to face my own challenges and document processes or be more organized or invest in technology because I could keep that revenue for myself. So playing for something bigger than yourself, if you were to get an extra 10 or 50 cases a year, what could you do for your community? I think oftentimes women are particularly burdened or, or guilty of this, is that we give and give and give and give instead of investing in ourselves and our own businesses and then there's nothing left. Whereas if we were to be a little bit selfish and invest in the business and not necessarily pay out or, or spend in areas where maybe we shouldn't, we would actually have more to invest in the business, grow the business and give back to the community. And then focusing on the vision for, of a future for your team and their families. So owning a niche, where do we start? So jack of all trades, master of none. This is probably one of the most common challenges that I see, especially in law firms that are just beginning to grow. You need revenue, so you're gonna take a lot of those cases that maybe you shouldn't or clients that you shouldn't, and nobody really knows what you do. So defining that mission statement, you'll hear me talk about uh, magic statements in some of my marketing classes, or if you're working with any of the marketing providers like Blue Shark Outside, you'll know that focusing on a niche and being the person that handles a particular type of case or a particular type of area of law is something that people recognize, something that people will then begin to know you for. Um, and that is recognizable. And when you're, let's just say, at a barbecue and you're talking to somebody, I always use this analogy, and they say, oh, what do you do? Oh, well, I handle car accidents and auto accidents, and I do a little bit of family law, and if you need a bankruptcy, I can handle that too. And all of a sudden, their eyes glaze over, and when the time comes to pass your referral, they can't honestly remember what you do. Whereas if you have a very passionate mission statement, I help mothers protect their children and leave a legacy for them after they're gone. That's an estate planning uh, lawyer who focuses on providing estate plans for mothers. And when you talk about your practice and talk about your mission and your goals and who you help in that way, it sticks with people. And so your website, your marketing copy, your own attitude, and this also translates down to your employees. When you have that laser focus on your niche, people know exactly what you do. They know who to refer to you and they know exactly how you operate as a business owner because that passion comes through in everything that they see. And I know at first it'll feel like you're turning down business, 
but and that's a really, really difficult first phase, but I will promise you that it pays off a hundredfold. So let's talk about branding. And this presentation overlaps in areas of technology and marketing because those are the kind of the two areas that I live in. Your name might not be the best brand for your business because again, it doesn't have that recognizable quality. It's that adding an additional layer. And I know in some states we have regulatory barriers of having to have your actual name. I'll give you an example. A, and in Georgia, you have to use the name of the lawyer in the law firm. One of the best uh, branded solo lawyer uh, law firms that I have seen in the last five years is Happily Ever After Divorce, trademarked. She could take that and become a national brand across the US. And at the bottom, and it's a dove, so it's a logo and it says happily after ever divorce and then uh, law group and then at the bottom or Atlanta divorce law group and then at the bottom it says by Sarah Khaki law and so that branding is something that incites an emotion within her potential clients um, the visa place is another good example of you know uh, national actually multinational uh, immigration law firm and so Consider that when you do your marketing. I'm not saying that you can't use your name, but there should be some type of tagline, some type of subset, some type of mission statement that goes along with your brand. And so consumers need to identify that. Colors do play, uh, have a little bit of an impact there. I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on branding and logos. That's like a six month conversation. So define, and anybody who's created a logo knows that. <laughs> so define your mission, um, commit to a culture, and then maintain those strict values. And this is as hard for me as it is for, for everyone else. Maintaining those strict values because I find that when you're growing a business, it's also pushing you to be more accountable as well. So if you want everybody to follow certain rules, that means that you also have to be accountable to the ones that you set forth. And every interaction is a direct reflection of your company culture. And so I have started you know, hiring employees for my business and it's little things that you have to catch and stay on top of. How are they answering an email? Are there pleasantries? Are they exuding that same mission? And if they're not seeing that passion and that specificity coming from you as far as this is the niche that we serve and this is why and this is my personal story getting in touch with that personal story and I mean, Jim and Tyson are, are great at conveying this it's painful right like your personal story is painful my personal story is the reason why I help solo and small law firms is that I grew up in a house of small businesses and family that owned small businesses and when things weren't working at the office things weren't working at home and that's a really, really painful thing to deal with when you're growing up. And the same thing happens in solo and small firms. When things aren't working at the law firm, when money's not coming in the way that it's supposed to, when it's dysfunctional, when there's battles with associates, that's translating into the home environment. So I'm personally passionate about serving this community because I feel like I make an impact when I help a solo or a small law firm make massive changes at the office. I know that's trickling down into their family life. And so getting in touch with that personal story and conveying that to your employees, this is why we help people. And then every interaction between referral partners, employees within the team, clients, all of that should center around that mission. And this is what a lot of people think that company culture is. It's not. <laughs> I did work at a company like this, and I can tell you that productivity dips after 2 o'clock. So um, that's not what company culture is. What company culture really means, and this comes from Tony Shea as well, is your brand is your culture. It's that mission statement that's your culture. It's that pride and your passion for what you do that translates into every interaction. And cultivating happiness for yourself, your employees, and your clients through achieving success for them. And I know in, in the area of uh, different practice areas, success means different things. And sometimes that outcome can't always be what we want it to be for our clients or can't always be what they that desired outcome was. But as long as you convey that passion and that purpose and the want and the will to help them, they will understand that you tried your best. And you know, I know that's like that one bad Yelp review that you get out of the 100, it's the 99 that count, right? So um, don't let that get you down. And how culture applies to your law practice specifically, are all of your employees motivated to help the clients so they all understand? So let's take this divorce law group in Atlanta, for example. Every single one of her employees has been affected by divorce in one way or another. And that is part of her interview process. 
So whether you run a immigration practice, a personal injury firm, a divorce firm, are you having those conversations with your employees? Is your mission statement on your wall? Do they understand what happens if, let's say, they don't file something on time or a client isn't notified? Do they understand the emotional and the personal pain that the clients are going through so that they can be empathetic to that? During the time that I owned a consulting practice back in, I don't know, 2012, 2013, I conducted over 600 interviews for law firms across the country, placing associates and intake staff. And I'll give you an example of how this can come out in an interview. So I was interviewing an associate for a bankruptcy practice. On paper, he looked amazing. I mean, this guy had all the credentials, clerkships. I mean, it was just everything that you would want to see in an associate in our price range. So it was fantastic. And I get on the phone with him and I start role playing and I say, okay, tell me, you know, why, what you think some of the reasons because we wanted him to get people to come in for consultations over the phone and then also do the consult and do the retain or I said to him can you tell me what you think some of the reasons why a bankruptcy client would be hesitant to come in and talk to the law firm because they constantly no show because they constantly you know blow off appointments or phone calls or running from creditors how are you going to motivate that client to come in and so this guy who was perfect on paper all of a sudden let loose on the phone and he said, oh, well, they should be ashamed of themselves and how could they ever let themselves get into this situation? And he went on and on and on and I'm just sitting there on the other line like, are you serious right now? This is not our guy. And so you have to find that. Are they empathetic to your clients? Are your employees empathetic to your clients? Vet that out in the interview process before they even come through the door because this is what people in the community are gonna see. This is what's gonna hap um, cause you to lose referrals. This is what your culture is about. Not necessarily having you know fancy furniture in your office and like playtime at lunch or whatever it is. So art can each employee articulate the reason behind your business and the success factors that happen when you achieve um, good things for your clients? And then just a few things, lack of connection to goals, lack of mutual respect. You see a lot of issues that happen between associates and intake or support staff. If they're not willing, um, one thing that will actually solve everything on this slide is job shadowing. That's the second phase of the interview and hiring process. I have an ebook on hiring. If anybody is interested, I can share that with you via email after yeah. the session. I wrote it for the Chicago Bar. Job shadowing does this. It creates an appreciation for the person who's doing that job. So it, will an associate go sit in the receptionist's chair and answer phone calls all day and realize how difficult that is when a client calls and they are pissed off? Will a support staff person ride along and go to court and sit and watch what the attorney has to go through? It creates an appreciation for every single com complimentary role in the law firm, but then what it also does is it also creates an understanding for what might be going on. It's not that you're just not answering emails or phone calls for the last four hours, it's that you're dealing with negotiating something while you're at court or in a consult with a client. And so by creating that transparency between roles, you can get rid of a lot of that um, inner team communication or inner team challenges. And Jack Welch said, uh, no company, small or large, can win over the long run without energized employees who believe in the mission and understand how to achieve it. And that understanding comes from understanding what everyone else in the firm does. So your mission statement. And we're moving it through this pretty fast. This is sometimes a, this is a combination of courses that I teach over like an eight hour period. So mission statement is why does your business exist? Who do you serve? Where are your clients? What services do you provide? And how do your core values guide your team? So you, mission statements and core values can be something that literally you can get caught up in for in a month. I'm trying to kind of like distill that down for you here in five minutes famous mission statements, like I look outside of the legal industry. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you see. I'm going to give you a few examples. Here are some of the strongest ones in, in the world, actually. And then the Zappos core values. So there's two different parts here. Your mission statement is your why and the what of you, what you do. And then your core values are basically your, your Ten Commandments, your governing principles, your core values that should be displayed on the wall in your office. They should be visible to clients, they should be visible to employees. And let me explain why this is so important. I don't enjoy reprimanding employees. I don't. And employees don't enjoy it either. 
I don't like to walk around and point fingers and say, no, you shouldn't do that, or this was wrong, or you know, yelling and that type of thing. It really doesn't get either party anywhere. This is what core values do. You put them on the wall, and when something happens in your office, you point to it and you say, is that an example of, of a reflection of our core values? Is trash on the floor a reflection of our core values? Is how you spoke to that client a reflection of our core values? And now you have a North Star to point to, to align everyone in the company as opposed to it being like a direct reprimand. And every single time I have handled a situation in this way, the employee literally looks at it and says, yeah, no, and they immediately go and correct it. It's not a derogatory interaction. You are saying all of us are buying into this. All of us are agreeing that this is how we are going to operate. And so this allows you to get everybody on the same page, and you don't have to have those really negative interactions because you're all working under the same guiding principles. Here's an example of a law firm mission statement. Provide the highest quality, integrity-driven legal services to our clients using a pra practical, consultative, client-focused approach to identify and respond to problems and challenges we strive to maintain in culture characterized by respect, opportunity, hard work, mutual empowerment, entrepreneurship, and fair reward efforts made on behalf of clients and the firm. That's a mouthful. I would actually cut that down to about half of what it is. So this is a lot of big words. It should be something where your clients read it. I actually like their vision a little bit better than our mission statement, but I kind of wanted to give you an example of, like, it doesn't have to be super wordy. I actually would prefer if they were short. We create happiness by providing the finest entertainment for people of all ages everywhere. So find, like, that happy medium between the law firm, you know, mutual empowerment, what I do like, mutual empowerment, hard work, entrepreneurship, creative solutions for our clients. I can actually send you, I'll give everybody my, my card or my email address after the session, but I'm happy to look at your mission statement. I'm happy to look at your core values over email and give you my feedback. Um, I, this is a little bit too wordy and just lots of like, you know, lots and lots and lots of commas. If you got more than three commas in a sentence, it should probably be more than one sentence. So defining your core values, three to five statements of passion tied to your mission statement, actionable and part of daily life. So I like this graphic because you can kind of pick and choose what you like from here. So if you were to pick three things from this tree and then combine them into a mission statement or fold around words like who you serve, where you're located, and a little bit about your personal story or your why, that can be crafted into your mission statement or your core values. Hey guys, it's Becca here. I'm sure you've heard Jim and Tyson mention the Guild on the podcast and in the Facebook group. That's because we're seeing some really exciting things happening with Guild members and their businesses. The Guild is this perfect mix of a community, group coaching, and a mastermind. Inside, you'll gain support, tap into a network of connections, and continue learning, a common theme among successful entrepreneurs. There are so many benefits inside the Guild, including weekly live events and discounts to all Maximum Lawyer events. Head over to MaximumLawyer.com forward slash the Guild to check out all of the benefits and watch a few testimonials from current members. Investing in a community is like the self-care of business ownership. Being in a community with other people who get it is crucial when you're creating a rock solid foundation to build your business on. One that's strong enough to withstand setbacks, transitions, and growth. So head to MaximumLawyer.com and click on the Guild page to join us. Now, let's get back to the episode. And then does it really work? So I lived in Chicago for 23 years. I was there when this happened. And this was, and there's a book I'm going to recommend to you based off of what we're talking about that, that includes a lot of what we're talking about today. But this is the result of when everybody is following those same guiding principles, everybody is working towards that same goal. Unbelievable things can happen. And so establishing a, a scalable client service path is the second portion of today's conversation. So the first is the mission statement and the guiding values and the why, right? So getting everybody on the same page of this is what we're working towards. And now the second part is the execution, right? Which is actually where I spend a majority of my time. Scalability, respect, accountability, retention, and growth. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about building a 100-year law firm. Whether you want to pass your law firm on or you just want to be in a position to sell it. I see so many great law firms 
die when the owner gets sick or when there's a marital issue between the the spouse that owns you know the law firm and and the owner it just doesn't move on it doesn't get inherited it doesn't get sold and so that 30 or 40 years of going into and building that practice can't be transferred because there was nothing that was scalable there was no documentation there was no systems and that's also the difference whether you want to pass your law firm on or sell it is the policies and procedures, the systems, the technology, because now they have a playbook. And that's in any business, in any industry, that's what I'm looking for if I'm an acquirer and I've handled a couple merger acquisitions. If you walk into a business and they have a playbook and they have technology and they have documentation where you can just come in and either take over the way that it is, leaving it exactly as it stands, or plug in your own people because you know exactly what they need to do, that business just got a multiplier of 10x. I'm willing to pay 10 times more for that business or see 10 times more value because I know that we can come in and follow a set of repeatable processes. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the second half of today's presentation. So understanding your client life cycle. And I've worked with this diagram for years now. It starts with client intake at the top, which is actually lead generation is part of that. So your marketing, your intake, conversion into a client. Then we move into case details, the actual execution, the word processing, all of that correspondence that happens, delivery or decision, and then completion and referrals. And there are pieces of technology and systems that speak to or handle for you every single section of that client cycle. So this is kind of a, an audit exercise. If we had like a half day workshop, this would be something that I would go through with a firm of what would you give yourself on a scale of one to 10 in each of these six sections? Do you feel that you have documented processes? Do you feel that you're using technology? Do you kind of like haphazardly just like, you know, do it and it's okay. Like I have in my own business, I'm going through a scalability phase or a scaling phase right now where I've brought on three new team members and I'm realizing like, oh, I just kind of like do this off the cuff and now people have to like mirror that, right? Like that's not a scalable process. So I'm being forced to be more accountable and it's not fun. Like, right, like all this stuff that's in my head is now going to have to go down on paper or be systematized with technology. So establishing a sane client service path, this also breaks us out of the stranglehold of being a solo. So dependency on an associate or partner servicing their case. I have seen solo attorneys raise their hourly rate to as high as $850 an hour or the consult fee as a $5,000 or $10,000 deposit so that they can break the cycle of, a of clients only wanting them and finally get some of that work down to another associate like the divorce lawyers or the lawyers who are known for a particular practice area that say, everybody wants me, everybody wants me. Well, raise your rate, and then all of a sudden everybody's gonna want the associate. So <laughs> that's, there's a real easy way to break that cycle. Um, but it's a dependency on the associate or partner servicing their case. You have to, and this is, goes back to that mission statement, by building out a team or empowering your team to all have that voracious passion for what you do, all marching in lockstep towards the success metrics for the client, it, it allows the client to have more trust and faith in the team. They don't have to call and speak to you. They're more willing to talk to everybody else. That's also what technology does. It gives the support staff a 360 degree view of the client so that I don't need to wait for somebody to get out of court to get an answer to them. I feel empowered to go into the system and get an answer and communicate to the client. I'm, if you've ever called a law firm, and I feel like I secret shop probably 50 law firms a week, and that's not an understatement, I don't even wanna share some of the things that I hear. It's the broken, I'm so like just frustrated, I don't have any answers, I don't know where anybody is, there's no documentation, and you can just hear it, you can feel it coming through the phone. Do you wanna work with a law firm like that if you're a potential client? Like, I actually write personal notes to the lawyers who own these firms, like, I don't know what is going on over there, but something needs to be worked out. Call me if you wanna talk about it. Lack of communication between support staff and lead attorneys, so again, documentation with technology, and then limited access to files. So again, just all going back to the fact that this can be a system, and I go through the same thing with my team. 
So building a team that's confident in supporting client calls, empowering them with the tools they need to do their work, sharing access. Um, one thing that I started doing here in the last month that's been was really hard for me, but it's been the best thing I've done for my business, was I started forwarding my personal cell phone number. So I forward my personal cell phone number to a virtual receptionist service. I personally use Answer One. You can use Ruby Receptionist. You can use Pat Live. You can use whoever you want. But that for me, I was like, oh, like my doctor's office is going to call. My friends are going to call. My mom is going to call. Like you don't do that, right? But how else am I going to break the cycle of clients calling my cell phone? There's no other way for me to do that. And it has been the best thing that I've done for my business and my personal life to date forwarding my personal cell phone. You can do it right inside the iPhone and I just forward it during the day and I take it off like on weekends or whatever. But it was the only way that I could break the cycle of people calling my cell phone. And they can schedule like the, the virtual receptionist service has a link to my calendar. They can schedule on there. And I also found that I'm getting more of my personal stuff done because all those personal calls that you don't take during the day, like now all of a sudden there's like to-do lists, to-do things scheduled on my calendar that I never would have done. So it's been great. And so this is the business impact on quality, cost, and service when you actually empower your employees and you start to delegate. It's our job as entrepreneurs to give people the opportunity to succeed. And we do not, we rob them of that when we don't delegate. And yeah, it sucks when you first start doing it. I, I totally admit that, like, oh, this is messed up and I could have done it myself in like a third of the time, but how else are they gonna learn? And I have, uh, personally, I have um, an administrative coordinator. That's her title, she's executive assistant. She does two things, she manages my calendar, she helps me with anything I forward to her over email, and she makes sure that we get paid. And over the last three months, it's just been like, or oh goodness, five months now, it's been a process of training her but it's been the most fabulous thing because it's like even the small things that get messed up or the emails that I have to correct, we're, every day we get a little bit better. Every day we, we get stronger. And now I can leave the office with no technology, connection to technology for five days and I know that she has it handled. So let's talk about the technology that you can do, use to do this and we're gonna move through this section pretty fast. So in 2013, there was uh, the target data breach Cloud technology came out around 2008. In 2017, what we noticed, and uh, the ABA also released opinion 477 on your uh, du duty to protect, take reasonable uh, measures to protect client data. This is not just about like systems and, and processes for your law firm. This is also about protection for the business that you are building and protection for the jobs of your employees. Malware and ransomware law firm attacks are no longer a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So we're not just talking about implementing systems in your firm, we're talking about building a fence and a wall around your firm that protects it from all of these other things that quite honestly are like the worst distraction that you need to have. You don't want to be the target calling your estate planning client saying, hey, by the way, all of your children's social security numbers were compromised because I had a laptop that had malware on it and now like it's all that data is gone. Financial records, mortgage statements, things that you're, are involved in the paperwork of a divorce are all residing on your local computers or if, not, if you're not using one of these systems. So just keep that in mind. So I don't like to talk about like the fear factor, but that's a very real thing. And then investing in technology for marketing, for scalability, for the disaster recovery. Disaster recovery doesn't always mean a hurricane or a flood. It could mean all of a sudden there's wildfires in California and you have to evacuate or there's your, something happened to your house or there's a gas leak and you can't get to the office for three days. Like there's weird stuff that happens that all of a sudden, you know, like a leak in the, in the ceiling and all the computers in the office are taken out. Like this stuff happens and so for disaster recovery purposes, this is also another reason why when we're looking at that generational law firm, technology is so important. And so just a few things in each category, marketing, logo, website, and then consistently sending email communication or social media. Scalability is case management, workflow tools, reporting. We're going to get into that next. Client service is case management, um, answering services, a client portal, online bill pay, and then reporting again. And documentation and then disaster recovery, again, case management, reporting, and disaster recovery is, you know, backups and IT. So all-in-one solutions in the marketplace, these are a few 
uh, there's two different types of case management systems in technology. I am uh, a legal technology evangelist, so you're going to get a dash of this here at the end. If you are interested in learning about any of these solutions, I wrote the 2017 Legal Technology Buyer's Guide. You can get a copy of that for free at learn, uh, learn.lextechreview.com. That's a library of all of our books. There's tons of free stuff in there. Everything is free, including a financial course from Kahuna Accounting. And the difference between these, so there's two types of practice management, and I'm only going to spend a couple minutes on this. You can either go with an all-in-one solution, or what now we are seeing is we're seeing either an all-in-one solution, like a Clio or a Cosmolex or a Practice Panther, with add-on tools attached to it. So let's say I'm going to add Lexicata, or I'm going to integrate Trustbooks. So you take that base, like general case management system, the Clio, the Practice Panther, the Rocket Matter, whatever your flavor of choice is, and then you connect other tools to it to get it to do what you want it to do. There is no silver bullet, I will tell you that right now. And if there is, it probably sucks at something. So just know that. Like there is no like holy grail of case management and anybody that tells you that it is, and I'll tell vendors this to their face, they're lying. You have to either kind of build your own or you go with a case, a practice area specific. So if you're personal injury, case peer, I know file vines outside. I was best case is for bankruptcy, a case fleet, really great for uh, litigators or employment law. Uh, next chapter is another bankruptcy. Wealth counsel is for estate planning or elder law. And so you can either go with a specialty solution that in a lot of cases, if you're only doing one practice area, like we talked about that niche, serving that niche, you're in a lot, my personal opinion is you're better off using a tool that's built for your practice area. The other option is to take one of those all-in-one solutions and then connect it to all kinds of other things to make it do what you want. And the investment in this, it, it's not easy. Anybody who's ever worked with something like Infusionsoft or <laughs> any other consultant related program knows it takes a while, but it is well worth the effort. And then what it gets you is reporting. And so I know, I think Mickey, I don't know if they have a, a booth, but I know Mickey from Kahuna Accounting is here. And I'm personally, I'm a, a Kahuna Accounting client, and that has done wonders for my business. It's created accountability for me to treat my business and, and act like a CEO and get a handle on my financials. It gives me forecasting to what I need to do. It also gives me clarity in the numbers that I need to hit. So if I want to have a reach certain goals by the end of the year so that I can do things like donate to charity, do something for my family, like buy a house or I bought a house last year uh, for, you know, my basically my mom's like final, you know, chapter. And it, it was something that I had worked towards really, really hard for a long time that I never thought would be possible. But it's because I put certain goals in place for my business and that was my motivator, my why on the end. And then I used that reporting to drive my own motivation of this is the number of clients that I need to get this month to be able to make that happen for my mom. And you can't see those types of things unless you have systems in place. And so the reporting we're going to get into is KPIs. KPIs are key performance indicators. That's a really fancy term for just metrics, right? So what areas of your business, what areas in your client cycle ha should have a metric that you are measuring? So what is the percentage of clients that actually give you a referral? Or maybe for consumer practice areas, what is the percentage of clients that give you a Google review or a Yelp review? That could be a KPI for consumer because that's going to drive more referrals. That's going to drive more traffic online. It might be website visitors. It might be your conversion rate from an intake call into a consult, into a retain. So think about what those numbers are for your firm, and that's what case management and these systems do for you. They give you transparency. It gets it out of paper. It gets it out of your e inbox. It gets it out of Excel, and it translates it into meaningful data. And so this is just an example of some of the, uh, this is law firm KPI examples. To show you how it looks inside of a case management system, this is the dashboard of a system called Centerbase. If anybody is coming from like an amicus or an abacus or a perfect law or a time matters and you're looking at switching to something in the cloud, this is a very popular tool, really great program. But you can see the WIP in the top left-hand corner, so work in progress this month, um, fees received, potential clients by practice area in the last 30 days, and if I hover over any area of that pie, it's going to tell me the case type. So this is the type of thing that you can be looking at as a owner, as a managing partner when you log in every single day. 
Here's another one. Um, this is an example of Smokeball's AI or activity tracking. Um, this is PC only, so our Mac users unfortunately won't be able to use it. But what this is, is this is actually artificial intelligence tracking all the time spent in every type of activity. So Microsoft Word, Outlook, calendar appointments. And what I love about this particular tool is that it shows you, if we look at the purple, this is where all the time is being spent. So maybe we need to hire a paralegal. It shows you workload. It shows and it can help you forecast when you need to hire because it's actually tracking activity throughout the day. So this is two very different reports. This is like financial and revenue compared to data on where is the time actually being spent and is it being built. So this is what these are the types of reports that systems can provide for you. And then we're going to wrap up today with some cash flow stuff. Mickey is far better at talking about this than I am. That's why he's on Lex Tech Review all the time. But uh, And his sessions are recorded on the site. Know your expenses, sending invoices out on time. Um, if there's one thing that I can say about invoices and collections, it is that if you don't send invoices out on time, your clients aren't going to prioritize paying. You set the tone for whether or not you get paid. My clients, when they sign up, there is a credit card form at the bottom of every single retainer agreement or engagement agreement that we have, and they go on auto pay. 30% of the checks that get sent to our business are lost. 30%. Check fraud is on the rise. It's credit card payment or nothing. And I would rather pay the fees and know that we're going to get paid on time than have it be like a, I mean, we're still chasing checks from four months ago. That's ridiculous. And the amount of admin time, the hours that she spends, can, will probably pay what's actually in those checks. Like we chased down a $200 check for six months. It was ridiculous. I think the paper actually cost more than the check. So um, credit card payments, online payments, online invoicing, and setting the expectation that this is how we get paid and this is the date at which we get paid. When somebody signs up for us, they're getting an invoice the same day. And so, Mickey, say hi to Mickey when you're here, because thank you so much for what you do for my business. And then engage in strategic planning. So all of this comes together uh, in either quarterly or every six months or uh, annual strategic planning sessions. So what is the mission statement? What is the core values? You start the meeting off with that. Your entire team should be engaged. And then you actually calendar out the goals that you're going to hit. So you take those KPIs and you say, in order for us to hit our goals, this is how many clients we need to get this month, this quarter. These are the changes that we're going to make for the business, which include technology implementations, which include marketing plans, which include all of these things. And you engage the team or even yourself. Engage your, your spouse or communicate to your family that this is what you're working on. And then have them be your accountability partners if you don't have staff. And then that drives you to hit those goals over the course of the year and reward yourself. You don't necessarily have to tie, it's not fee sharing and there are compensate, ways to compensate employees by giving bonuses for milestones being hit that are ethically sound. And if you need example of, of examples of those, I'm happy to share some with you after today's session. I'll be here both today and tomorrow. So strategic planning should happen on a quarterly, uh, once every six months or once every year basis. And you should just Reset, and sometimes you look at your goals and you wipe them all out and you do new ones because the priorities of the business have changed. Maybe you're gonna open a second location. Maybe there's uh, a new practice area that you're gonna launch. And then lastly, lead with confidence. I think that this is probably one of the hardest things. Thoughts become things, so choose the good ones. You literally mirror your attitude and your energy onto your employees. So as you build your firms, and this also comes back to how you're dealing with clients. If you're having a bad day, like you just have to reset. You have to stay positive. Try to not let what happened yesterday spill into today. As hard as I know that that might be, be helpful to others and just reset yourself because it's how you start every single day. What happened yesterday, you can't change it, right? So why are you going to let that ruin what's happening today and into the future? And then this is the recommended reading. Today's presentation and pretty much everything that I teach is governed by a lot of what I, I see from other business owners. Personally, if I had to pick three, I built my business um, based off of these three books at the bottom. I'm gonna leave uh, you today with just a couple thoughts on sales. I know that selling legal services and the talk of leads is not always the most popular conversation. Um, most sessions that I teach at bar associations that include those words in profit as well are not accredited. I don't 
really um, not even going to get into the why behind that. But if you want to read a really great book on audio or um, physical, is Seller Be Sold by Grant Cardone. And it talks about how it is our ethical duty and obligation, responsibility and obligation to sell our services, to help people. Because if we don't do that, then how are we going to create revenue to grow our business, to provide jobs, to take care of our family, to plan for that rainy day, and to give back to our community? So if you've ever struggled with the is it, you know selling legal services or getting a certain number of clients or being aggressive about your marketing or really stepping into your own power of who you can be and what your practice can be, then read some of these books because you are robbing everyone else around you of the opportunity to do great things by not being that leader. And so that's what I want to leave you with today. These are some of the books that have governed um, a lot of what I teach and a lot of what you see on our website. So it has been a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having me. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, that's a great question. How do you involve team members in um, strategic planning? So you have a pre-planning session as management. And you basically break down, OK, so these are the goals that we're going to talk about. And then you look at how it affects each one of those team members, because I would imagine each team member is responsible for a particular department or a function in that client cycle, right? So, and you'll be amazed at how in that, in that collaboration session, they will actually help each other and come up with ideas. So you have a pre-planning session, and then when you actually have your strategic planning with the team and take them off-site or do it in a place where, you know, you're not distracted by client calls or anything like that, um, it can be... That, to me, is the best way, so at least you're not walking in and like get blindsided by um, by random conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, I did say that. I did say logos don't sell legal services. It is just that like grit and getting out there and working, you know, pounding the pavement and making it happen using marketing tools. So for a quick logo, you can do 99 designs. I think their lowest package is $2.99. You literally get like 30 different options. I've tried a few of their services. That's the best one. Um, the cheapest that you're going to get at logo design if you work like with a graphic designer is usually about 600 bucks. So I love 99 designs because you just get this array of things that you never would have even thought of. Um, I'm actually, I've got one underway for another project myself right now. Yeah, that's a great point, Seth. Um, so you get the name. I always ask for, hey, can I get your email address for work after the fact? And they will, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff. It's a graphic designer that now knows your brand. 99, just the number, designs.com. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, you can probably get a code. There's, if you look around for codes, there's discount codes, too. I think Pat Flynn has them. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your hosts and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time. Maximum.